Welcome to the Bite Size PD for multilinguals. Let me share my screen. Welcome to this Bite Size PD, classroom supports that greatly impact diverse learners. I'm Bernice Allen. I am the elementary multilingual specialist, and I'm here to talk about some strategies that we can use with our ML, especially our newcomers. Everything we do ties to our, M our MTSS, and today we're kind of living in standards for instruction and evidence-based instructional priorities for academics and those that are going to make a big impact. So our learning intention today is you're learning reasonable expectations for newcomers and how to scaffold instruction, accommodate workload and assessment. I know I'm successful when I can explain one or two strategies I'll use to scaffold instruction or accommodate workload or assessments. And I put the word newcomers in there, but this is also for your MLs anywhere between um, level one and three. So we still wanna offer scaffolds and our, for our instruction and for really for workload and assessment up until they're, they're proficient, right? So the bad news is there's no silver bullet. There's not one thing that I'm gonna teach you here today that will really make all the difference and all of a sudden they'll be on grade level. There just really isn't. And I loved this um, definition that my colleague shared with me that the some synonyms for silver bullet. And when we're talking about um, working with ML students and we often use things like silver bullet, right? That doesn't mean a lot in, unless you know the context, kind of some synonyms, synonyms for that. So a quick fix, a solution. There's not anything really fast that I'm gonna be able to tell you. But the good news is, there are so many engagement strategies that you are already using and scaffolds that you're using that you don't think of that are already affecting for the positive your ML students and all your students. So today we're going to discuss scaffolding instruction, accommodating workload and accommodating assessments. So first let's talk about scaffold instruction. We scaffold instruction to give students access to grade level content. So when we're scaffolding it, we're scaffolding what we're teaching whole group and even in small group for grade level access to grade level content. And the access is the key word because we're not necessarily scaffolding for mastery for students that are just coming, that are barely new to our country, that may be in a silent period and may need more time, they're not going to be proficient in our grade level standards by the end of the year, especially if we're getting them now in March. We're seeing a big influx in our newcomers to the country right now. So what we're doing is giving them access to it and we're giving them access by scaffolding instruction. And according to Pauline Gibbons, a scaffold is a temporary support a teacher provides to a student that enables the students to perform the task they wouldn't be able to perform alone. I'm gonna paraphrase this because you can read it on your own, but scaffolds will vary and change over time as EL's knowledge or ML's, we say ML, but in this article, content academic language increases. And in fact, our goal when scaffolding for EL's is ultimately for them to be able to perform the task independently. But again, it may be that you are scaffolding this entire year as they're brand new, and next year the scaffolds get to be lifted a little bit. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to get to a point this year where there's no scaffolds. So here are some scaffolds that we suggest and think are high impact for our students using sentence frames and sentence charters. Whenever you're having them have a discussion or collaborative conversation, provide that sentence frame and that stem so that they only, the cognitive load is lessened, they only have to think of that one word in English that on their own. They can read the others if they're fluent in English. And if not, their partner that they're partnered with has that sentence frame to help them as well. Using visuals and gestures for new concepts or words, as much as we can use a total physical response or any kind of kinesthetic 
um, gesture for things, um, the better we are. And for all of our students, right? It's, it's good for all of our students to get up and get moving and remembering things. Do group work, pairing ML newcomers with strong language examples that work well with others. When they're brand new, pairing them with someone who speaks their same language if they have one, that can help them with directions. We don't want that to be a direct translator that translates everything you're saying and everything you're teaching into the language that gets exhausting for that person that's translating, especially if you're in the lower grades, and it gets exhausting for that other student. But it would be helpful for a student who speaks their language to help as they go out to recess and as they go out to lunch and as they're learning the routines and procedures of your classroom, but not necessary. If you don't have anyone that speaks that language, pairing someone that is patient and kind and that has the skills and really um, good language that can help them and, and likes to work with other people, pair them with, with them too. Using manipulatives. We think of manipulatives a lot with math, but also when we're doing phonemic awareness or doing any kind of literacy activity, as we've learned in letters, using the unifix cube as um, sounds, as we blend out the phonemes, as we delete and substitute in different cases, using those manipulatives all the time, using them on your mat. So that is a high yielding scaffold for ML students. Use of graphic organizer. But remember, just handing them a graphic organizer isn't going to help them. But helping scaffold that graphic or organizer and being explicit about what goes on there, perhaps modeling, having exemplars on there, that's going to provide a scaffold for our students. Concrete examples and non-examples and use of realia, of real objects. So if I have a real object as an example, I'm going to use that. We often forget the use of non-examples. So if I'm talking about a vocabulary word, giving a non-example of that vocabulary word can help them build that schema as well. And then check in with students before asking them to work independently, if you're having them work independently. Again, they never have to get to the point, they can always work in, in partner or par, you know pair up, but if you're wanting them to do something on their own, check in with them, make sure they understand the direction. And then always going back to our wiser. And in the presentation that is included here in the Bite Size PD, this um, graphic is a link to the, um, to the wiser in the instructional guides. So when we plan using wiser, we're thinking about opportunities in every single lesson that we do for writing, for inquiry, reading and speaking. We also pair reading with viewing. So it doesn't necessarily need to be that they read something. It could be that they're viewing it. If we're reading a passage about animals and I have them view a video and maybe in the video, they even have labels or names in words as well that they can have schema built for as well. And then besides, we always want our first interaction with our MLs and our first step to be building a relationship and building those relationships, making them feel a part of our class and important. And, and even if they're not speaking the language that, that they really are an important part of our class. So once we've done those, here are some instructional supports, visuals, visuals, and more visuals, as many as you can, will always help them solidify adding visuals to your daily schedule with labels. And I have an example. You can really use any visuals you want, but I did go and make some for each grade level with just your book. So if I'm, this is second grade, if I'm in the core phonics and we say it's 95% time on the schedule or we call it foundations and we just put a little picture of our book here and maybe we're working with our mat. So here's a picture of our mat. And I have wonders in math and I have them for every grade level. So this is available on that slideshow as a link as well, that you can use these if you'd like. And I made it so that you have editing access. So you can change them. You can make them smaller, bigger, whatever you want, whatever works for you. Those just a way for them to really have a connection between the material you're asking them to use 
and the word, the word for it as well. Have visuals of your lunch choices with the labels. And if you don't have those, the district, um, the TRC does have those that you can use where I believe federal and state programs also has them so that they are seeing the label of the, what the word is and what the picture is as well. Visuals of your classroom routines with labels, where they line up, where we sharpen our pencil, where if we partner talk. And in Wonders, they have that icon every time they're partnering talk of the two kids with the little circle. Even using that as a indicator that we're partnering, that we're partner talking. Using your um, explicit systematic vocabulary routine that again, I've linked here to our instructional guide. Use total physical response as much as possible. Having students think of gestures for the words is also a great strategy. So if my class comes up with gestures, as we talk, as I give them the definition and I, we do the steps, if they want to come up with a gesture as a class so that we all have the same gesture so we can use that throughout the week. Provide many examples of the word. Avoid having students look up de definitions in the dictionary or coming up with a definition. Saying to your class, our word is plain. Does anyone know what that means? It is not effective. We often will get misdefinitions or misconceptions. And then for a language learner, they don't, they don't have enough language to know that you say, no, that's not it. It's this one. We really need to stay really explicit. We get the friendly definition. We then break the words into parts and have them do activities with the words. Strategically place ML students um, by students who are strong lang language examples and strong partners, which we talked about at the beginning as well. Another way as we're doing instruction, as we're doing reading, here are some ways that you can scaffold reading tasks. And this doesn't necessarily just mean during wonders time. It could be if we're reading for science or we're reading for social studies. Anytime we're doing any kind of reading, set the purpose for reading. What are you reading this for? What are we looking for as we're reading? What is our end we want to come up with? Complete the first read as a text as a class. Use a reading strategy or the teacher while students track the text or having them use it um, the wonders online and having them follow along as it reads, any of those where they get to hear it. Jigsaw the reading and purposely give lower level ML students. If we're reading about a science topic and it can be broken into pieces and then each, each person or group only reads a piece and then they discuss it, you're lowering that reading and the, um, the cognitive load for those students but enabling them to be able to have a conversation as well. And then label diagrams or pictures that are being used to support the text. So here's an example. This is a fourth grade example, right from Wonders. I just took a shared read and I wanted to show you a couple of things. Right here under the shared read is a little notebook paper looking thing. And this will read a summary of the story in their native language. I believe there's 20 languages on there. So there's quite a few. So my first step would be um, to have them to have them listen to that. So there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, when you assign, when you have your students get onto Wonders Online through Clever, all of their stuff, as long as your calendar is up to date, is already populated right there. And they go into the reading um, icon of that and it's right there for them. When they come in, they can click summary and then they can choose their language. So there's that. Then there's these reading marks that they can use. So as a teacher, I'm always reading the text first. I have to read the text first in order to know what, again, what is my purpose for reading? Where am I wanting them to go? If the first time I'm reading it is with them, I'm not purposely planning those scaffolds ahead of time. Um, one way to kind of, you know, I've had a lot of teachers who have said, we just don't have time. We're just so pressed. Play it, have it play it for you. And while you're cleaning your room or while you're getting it ready for tomorrow or while you're, whatever you're doing, 
have it read it to you so that you have at least some idea of the story. Then read that short summary that you're going to have them listen to. Listen to it in English so that you know what it's summarizing and what points they're taking from the text so that you can really focus on those as well through your conversation. And then add any visuals that may support the understanding of the text. And I'm going to show you an example of that. And for students, allow them to listen to the summary of the story before reading it as a class. And then as the class reads the story, explicitly show the visuals and their labels. So again, I took this fourth grade example of Judy's apple Asia. I don't know what's happening with my mouse here. And I just took a picture of mountain top removal mining, which is the big, a big um, topic in this text. And I just Googled a picture of it and brought it into my slideshow. You could have it printed out. You could have it, um, you can upload pictures into your presentation on wonders. And the words are directly from the wonders. So I, I did a little engineering of the text where I took the text and I bolded the word I wanted to really show that I'm showing in this picture, mountaintop mining, removal mining, and that what happened because of that was that there was coal and sludge and chemicals and that it polluted into their river. So all I'm doing is adding a few pictures. I use the, the original text and I just bolded it. But as we're talking about these things, I now have a little bit of visual for them to build their schema. I also just took the picture right out of the story of Julie Bond um, speaking up against um, mountaintop removal mining. And then here's a picture. I also just Googled Julie Bond. And so here's a picture of her actually protesting. So when we're talking about protesting, I can show pictures of what that was. I also thought they might not know what a miner was, especially if they're coming from a country where there isn't mining and so showing them a picture of those. So those are just a couple of the things that I pulled out. So during my lesson, I would just show those visuals and have them either, again, either put them into my presentation, have them printed out. So now I can add those visuals to that. So now I've scaffolded it. We've, I've scaffolded my conversation. I've had sentence starters when we're talking. So now let's talk about accommodating workload. When it gets to the part where I want them to do some work, what are the best ways for MLs to show their understanding? That's my question. My question isn't how much of the page do I want them to do or how many problems can I cross out? It's how, what do I want them to know to show for understanding? And I'm showing examples of ELA today, but this can be done in math or any subject. So I prioritize the key ways students will demonstrate learning. I provide sentence frames or stems or word banks on the written task. I allow a spoken response or a picture representation instead of writing. If I'm not assessing writing standards, there's no reason it needs to be in writing if I need to accommodate to know what they know about the story or for the reading standards. Accommodate the complexity and or length of the task, not the grade level content. This is a big one. If I'm asking students to write a paragraph, I might have them only tell me a paragraph or tell me a couple of sentences, but I'm not going to completely take away that task and say, here, do this sheet where you write the alphabet in third grade or fourth grade. I'm going to stay with my grade level. I'm accommodating what that looks like, but I'm not accommodating the, the grade. As you're planning, look at specific tasks and which of those tasks you'll have the MLs complete. So here is an example of that same story. So now we've read our story and I want my, my students to do things, right? Right in Wonders, there is this page that has the sentence frame. What did Judy decide to fight against? With a starter, Judy decided to, I know this because, and this might even be too hard. I might not even get to, I know it because, or the page numbers. They might not be able to go back in the text. But here are some really great sentence starters and frames built right into Wonders. And then if I'm having them write about it, again, here's some great sentence frames as we're leading up to our assessment of this. 
What does Judy Zappalacia help you understand about the ways one person can make a difference? This is our essential question. And as I built that up and we talked about that before, now Judy decided to fight against mountaintop removal mining because, and at this point, I might even show him that picture again and say, remember mountaintop removal mining? Why did she fight against it? And allowing them to talk it in sentences instead of having to write it here. So I'm doing all of this as we're doing our work. And if we're in math, I might be picking specific problems that lower the language level, but not the grade. I'm not going to just have them do simple math facts because they don't know them. I'm going to have them really diving into it, but I might not have them do the story problems at very first. It might just be those computa computation right now until I can scaffold them enough to give them enough language. So then differentiating assessments. What will the assessment show me about the progress of my students? That's what I'm really, I'm building assessments to say, what will this show me? And if I'm not going to guide, use my assessment to guide instruction or further decision, I might want to rethink that. So Diane Fenner in the article that was mentioned before, I thought this was really powerful because I know my first, my first thought is, but if I scaffold the assessment or if I change it, it's invalid. So I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because it's there for you to read, but I love this part. When you remove or diminish the language barriers that might be obstacles for ELs, you increase the validity of that assessment and will be able to more accurately identify their content knowledge and skills. What a powerful statement that we are, we are diminishing the language and validating the assessment. So let me show you a couple of ways, again, on that same example. We're thinking only the essential pieces to show mastery. The language MLs have acquired may not Think of your non-traditional ways oral response, sort pictures, use diagrams or organizers. It's going to look very close to how I accommodated their workload. Focus on the absolute essential product needed for the student to demonstrate learning and ensure they've had ample practice with the language and the structure of the assessment. I'm scaffolding the instruction. I'm showing pictures. I have all of this that I'm building up. I know what my assessment is going to be at the end. So when I'm doing instruction, I'm really scaffolding everything so that I'm getting them to where I want them to be at that assessment. So here was the original task in Wonders as the assessment. This year, we told you to just use the respond to reading as you're writing assessments for the stories. So here's the original task. How do Judy's actions help readers understand why it's important to stand up for rights, for, for what's right? No scaffolds, no sentence frames, just an original task. Here's a scaffolded, oops, there we go. Here's a differentiated assessment. I now have my, how do Judy's actions help her? Over on the side of that, they even had sentence frames to think about. So now before we write, and again, for all of your students, it's not gonna hurt them to discuss what they, to discuss it before they write it. It's not gonna invalidate the assessment. We always want them to talk before we write. So here's the sentence frames that are a built-in scaffold. Judy Bond realized she needed to protest against mountaintop removal mining when, some effects, and allow them to talk it out. Then for those students, allow them to have a piece of paper that has those typed out for them and all they have to do is answer those questions. So all I did was take those sentence stems and put them into um, a form where they could just write the words. Judy Bond realized she needed to protest against mountaintop mining when, and again, if they're not to the writing part, I can have them tell me if I'm not using this as a written assessment. If I want to use this as an assessment for writing, for my writing standards, then allow them to write what they can, which is why we're providing them with stems. Another idea is to do a frame, a paragraph frame instead of stems. 
I got this exactly. I did not come up with anything on my own. I used the annotated teacher's edition from Wonders and I simply copied and pasted and then took out words or things that I know that I had scaffold and that I had helped that they would be able to do. And again, they might need me to help them read this. And if I'm, a, if I'm assessing writing, I'm going to let them try to write. If not, if I'm assessing a reading skill, I'm going to let them read it to me or tell it to me. If I have a real newcomer that's really struggling or just a really struggling ML student, here's another scaffold. I take the pictures that I already used in my, um, that I was using for instruction. And now I say the problem in the story is, and I could even have them point to it. What was the problem? What did we talk about here? Even if they just say mountaintop, blowing up, mining, right? Jo Judy Bond wanted to fix it because, and letting them use the pictures, or again, if they're very, very low, they could be pointing. What, which one of these shows the problem in the story? What shows what she wanted fixed? What did she do? And then letting them point if they're very newcomers, allowing students to answer orally, sorry, moving my face around, um, in their native language into Google Translate is also another way. So if I feel like them getting the language out is a barrier, but I feel like they could tell me it in their native language, let them try, let them do it. And then bringing it all together. The key to scaffolding and accommodating work and assessments is knowing your students' strengths. As you plan, consider language demands and where best to scaffold instruction, workload, and assessment. Students should always have access to grade level content. Our goal is to make it accessible for them. This does not mean they will mas they must master it at the end of grade level. There is no hard and fast rule. You know your students best and what will meet their needs. You know how to help them succeed and be the best they can. So did we, did you learn reasonable expectations for newcomers and how to scaffold instruction? Some ideas for accommodating workload and assessment. Hopefully we've addressed those. And then I've also just included some extra resources to consider. This is just a graphic that I really like that shows if we're a beginning English language learner, some things that you can do and what students do. So I included the beginning and the developing with what their LIDA levels are. And then thank you so much for listening to this Bite Size PD and for wanting to learn more about how to help our ML students